Yeah, so as I said in the, in the first lecture, I'm roughly dividing this course into three parts. Um, the first two parts are rather short. They are on SON1 and SP2N. And then I'll move to the third part, which is PGLN. And we were in the middle of the discussion of uh, Siegel modular forms. And um, yeah, so what I would like to discuss briefly at this point is Hecke theory. Uh, for Siegel modular forms. Um, of course, only in the unramified case. Um, the ramified case, I don't know if this has ever been worked out, but it's, it's certainly very complicated. So, gamma is the group SP2NZ, so the analog of the full modular group. And um, Hecke operators are parametrized by double cosets of the form. So we fix a prime P. Fix a prime P. gamma and then a diagonal matrix with entries p to power a1 up to p to power an and then p to the power r minus an p to power r minus a1 two n elements and gamma and we can order them such that a 1 is greater than 0, and so on. And it's uh, in increasing order up to a n. And then it continues to increase. So a n is bounded by r over 2. And r is some integer. So r is basically the, the, the degree of the, of the Hecker operator. In particular, if r is 1, then there is only one such Hecker operator. That's simply Tp. And by slight up use of notation, I just write the double coset. That's just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then p, 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 p. Hecker, there are several Hecker operators of degree 2. Ti of p squared is of the following form. I have a couple of ones, i of them. And then I have a couple of p's, n minus i of them. And then again, a couple of p's, n minus i and p squared. In particular, so this is for 0 less than i less than n with possible equality. In particular, if i is 0, then this is just p, 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 so this is the identity. So t0 of p squared is the identity. And it turns out that tp and then tip for 1 less than i less than n minus 1 generate the, Hecke, the p part of the Hecke algebra. So every Hecker operator in P um, is a polynomial in these operators. They have some nice properties. They're a Hermitian with respect to the inner product that we defined. They are commutative.
And of course, by the Chinese remainder theorem, everything is multiplicative. So if I take two different primes, then everything is nicely multiplicative. But if I stay with one prime, then the Hecke relations become very complicated. Hecke relations are very complicated. Um, this is a, a very, very complicated combinatorial problem to write down a linear. So if you multiply two Hecke operators, um, you can write them as a linear combination of other Hecke operators. But the linear combination is very complicated. And I don't think, so to my knowledge, uh, in general, um, there, is, there is no uh, closed formula or, or not even an easy algorithm. Uh, to compute what the product of two Hecker operators is. Here's a, a, a simple example. Tp squared. We would like to write this as a linear combination of degree two Hecker operators. And this is T2 p squared plus p plus one T1 p squared plus p to the power 3, p squared, p1, times the identity. But this is the simplest of all non-trivial um, Hecke relations. And they, they become completely crazy um, if, you, uh, if you want to write down linear combinations for products of Hecke operators. Am I, what, what am I missing? Yeah, I, I, you don't write a double coset for ti of the square. Oh, yeah, 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 OK. Um, OK, for holomorphic Siegel modular forms, the Ramanujan conjecture is known, just as in the case of genus 1. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. Of genus 2, the Ramanujan conjecture is known. This is work of Weissauer. Um, but as I said, there, there is no really clear connection between uh, the, the Satake parameters and uh, the, uh, the Fourier coefficients. And so what does this mean? It means that the Satake parameters have absolute value 1 unless the form f is a lift. And I will explain what a lift is uh, in a moment. All right, L functions. I'm not going to go in any detail. Um, I will just mention there are two types of L functions. There is the so-called standard L function, which is a, an L function of degree 2n plus 1. And here, the analytic continuation and functional equation are known. And there is the spinner L function, of degree 2 to the power n. And here, the analytic and functional equation is known in the case n equals 2, but not in general. My impression is nevertheless that the spinner L function is used more often. 
uh, than the standard L function. Um, yeah, in any case, I'm not going to go into, into uh, more definitions, but certainly in the case n equals 2, there is a degree 4 and a degree 5 L function. OK, finally, lifts, because they produce some arithmetically interesting objects. The most famous lift is in the case in n equals 2, the Saito Kurokawa lift. This is the case. n equals 2. And this has been generalized to arbitrary, I think, even n or so. Um, uh, that I will discuss this later. So the idea is the following. Um, we take a classical uh, holomorphic cusp form of genus 1 and weight 2k minus 2. So this is the space of holomorphic cusp forms uh, on the upper half plane, the usual upper half plane of weight 2k minus 2. And by the theory of half integral modular forms as developed basically by Shimura, um, you can associate to this half integral weight modular form with the following Fourier expansion. It has some coefficients that I normalize to be of absolute value roughly 1. So the exponent is k over 2 minus 3 over 4, e of mz. And this is a half integral weight form of weight k minus a half of level 4. And it is in Conan's plus space which means that m is congruent to either 0 or minus 1 mod 4. So only half of the coefficients occur. OK, and then valz pouget's theorem tells us that these coefficients are central twisted L values of the original function f. So this is up to normalization. I mean, g is only defined up to a, a scalar multiple. But I can choose a normalization such that the coefficient is the, the central L value, chi d, at least for d a fundamental discriminant. Um, uh, yes. Um, yeah, for, for non-fundamental discriminants, there is also a formula, but that's a bit more complicated. And then I can attach to G, or these coefficients, a Siegel modular form as follows. So I. I um, proceed on this blackboard. To this, I can attach a Siegel modular form, capital F of Z. It has a Fourier expansion, sum over matrices T, AT, E of trace TZ. And that's a Siegel modular form of weight K for SP4Z. And the ATs are given explicitly. And in certain cases, they can be described quite easily. It's determinant of 2t to the k over 2 minus 3 over 4 times c, where c is this Fourier coefficient, coefficient determinant of 2t. And this holds at least if minus 1 to the power k minus 1 times that. 2t is a fundamental discriminant. And if not, then there is a slightly more complicated formula that describes these Fourier coefficients. Um, yeah, so the Fourier coefficients are up to normalization. Um, well, they are basically the, the Fourier coefficients of this half integral weight uh, modular form. 
So capital F is the so-called Saito Kurokawa lift of either F or G. This is also sometimes called the Maas Spezialschar, um, because Hans Maas uh, investigated this a lot, and he called it Spezialschar, so special whatever. It's, I guess it's untranslatable. Um, <laughs> Uh, but if you if you find this this phrase spezial char, then it uh, uh, refers to, um, or sometimes it's also called the mass space. So the subspace of capital F of this form inside the whole space of Siegel mode. I mean, it's of course only a very small subspace uh, of forms that that are lifts. But this is sometimes called the mass space inside the space of all Siegel uh, modular forms. OK, so these, these lifts are quite interesting. Um, let me mention two results. There is Ichino's period formula. Um, so what you can always do, this has nothing to do with lifts. What you can always do if you have a Siegel modular form, you can restrict it to the diagonal. And by this I mean if you have a point z x plus i y, in the Siegel upper half space of genus 2, um, then you can write this as x1, x2, x2, x3, plus i, y1, y2, y2, y3. And you can project this onto the diagonal x1, x3, plus i, y1, y3. And then this lives on two copies of, of the usual upper half plane. There is a complex number x1 plus iy1, and then there's a complex number x3 plus iy3. So the, the restriction to the diagonal restricts to two copies of the upper half plane. So so you get a, get a function that lives on, on two congruence uh, quotients. And what you can do now is you can take the L2 norm of the, uh, so both of these are of course equipped with an inner product. And um, you can take the L2 norm uh, of the restriction relative to the L2 norm of the original function. And if you equip everything with probability measures, then it turns out that this ratio is given as follows. It's pi squared over 15 L3 half F. So now F is a, is a lift. So F is a lift of this F over there. And F is assumed to be Hecke normalized. So little f is a Hecke eigenform. There is a unique way of doing this, putting the first Fourier coefficient to be 1. Um, 1 sim square f times 12 over k minus 1. And then a sum over an orthonormal basis. So this is an orthonormal basis of sk. So notice that f has weight 2k minus 2, but here we are summing over forms of weight k, 1 half sum square phi times f. Yeah. So this makes good sense. I mean, this sum has size k, and on Lindelof, all of these are essentially bounded. So you divide by k, and all of this is also bounded. So roughly speaking, the, um, the mass is rather evenly concentrated on the diagonal. But it's a very beautiful formula. It's, uh, it, um, it compares the mass on the diagonal with the complete mass, and it's given as a mean value of, of certain degree 6 uh, L functions. OK, so that's one thing. And the other thing is that uh, the L function, so the, the spinner L function, L spin, of this lift f 
agrees with the original L function of the uh, cusp form little f up to some simple factors. Zeta of s minus k plus 1 times zeta of s minus k plus 2 times L f s. OK, and this Saito Kurokawa lift has been generalized uh, to arbitrary values of n by, well, it was conjectures, uh, conjectured, I think, by, by Duke and Imamoglu, and it was then proved by Ikeda. So this is called the Ikeda lift. Generalization to arbitrary n. This is the Ikeda lift, which has similar features, um, but it's more complicated, for instance, in the sense that uh, for Saito Kurokawa, one can give the Fourier coefficients exactly, even for non fundamental discriminants. This is a complete disaster in general. There are formulas, but they are, they are not manageable. OK, so finally, um, a bit of literature for further reading. Um, a very good book, and I think one of the standard references, is Freitag's book, Siegelsche Modulformen, which unfortunately is in German. Um, nevertheless, uh, I think it's one of the standard references. Um, there is a, a shorter book that basically contains a subset uh, of Freitag's book by Klingen. This is in, Eng in English, introductory, int introductory lectures to Siegel modular forms or something like this. There's a very old book by Siegel, um, which is called Symplectic Geometry. And it was, in fact, a research paper that appeared uh, in the uh, American Journal of Mathematics. Uh, but it's like 100 pages long, and then uh, they decided to make a book out of it. So it's, it's the, the exact copy of, of the original paper. Um, this Siegel's book contains much of the underlying geometry. OK, uh, any questions? Is the analytic continuation and functional equation known for the spinner L functions in general? No, uh, no. I think for n equals 2. Um, and I'm not sure what the state of the art is with n equals 3. Um, perhaps there is some partial, I don't know. Uh, but certainly not in general. OK, any other questions? Uh, it was, there are a lot of works of uh, Kopkonen and Zagir about Shimura lift from the Congruence uh, subgroup, and we start not the homomorphic forms on model groups, but on congruence part groups, and then leave them for half weight forms. Is there an analogous here? Yes, yes, sure. I, so, I mean, f I'm, I'm not going to go into the, in, into the greatest, most, most greatest detail. Um, so certainly, you can do this for congruent subgroups as well. Um, but I mean, this nice formula of Kohn and Zagier, to my knowledge, exists for the full modular group. Uh, although, of course, uh, the general um, framework holds, in, uh, holds uh, in generality. In any case, uh, this certainly is possible for, for congruent subgroups. There, there's nothing special about uh, the modular group, except that everything is simpler. For these uh, two <coughs> L functions, I mean, how should one think about the fact that these two different ones are they meant to reflect different underlying aspects of the form or anything like that? Well, combinatorially, they are, they are, um, it's, it's a different combination of, of the Satake parameters. I mean, they are, of course, defined by Euler products, and the, the Euler factor is a certain combination of the Satake parameters, and you can do this in different ways. Well, I mean, at least for SP4, it's also there's two fundamental representations of SP4. And these are the Langlands L functions attached to these two fundamental representations. So a priori, they, they behave quite independently. OK, well, then this ends my short discussion of Siegel modular forms. And um, so I'm now going to move on to PGLN.
OK, so here's the setup. Our group G is PGLN of R. I won't mention adults in this, in this uh, lecture. Everything is either over R or, or over QP, but um, uh, no adults. OK, it has an Eva Zavak decomposition, NAK. N are the unipotent matrices. K is PON. Gamma for us is just SLNZ. Again, you can talk about congruent subgroups, but I'm not going to do this. H, this is now a third H. It's uh, not the Siegel upper half plane. It's not a hyperbolic upper half space, but it's a, well, it's a model for G mod K. The dimension of H is n minus 1 times n plus 2 over 2. And we choose the following coordinates. We choose the Iwasawa coordinates coming from A and K. So a point Z, little z perhaps, is x times y. And x is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 something. And y is given by 1, y1, and so on, up to y n minus 1, y1. OK, and w is the Weil group. OK, um, so for n greater than 2, strictly bigger than 2, uh, there are no holomorphic forms. So everything is a, is a mass form. And, um, so we, uh, we really think of, of these forms as mass forms. And so we talk about differential operators. D is the algebra of G invariant differential operators on H. And that's the center of the uh, universal enveloping algebra. And this turns out to be a polynomial ring, perhaps a polynomial ring in n minus 1 variables. And this can be viewed as polynomial functions on the dual of the Lie algebra of A. So A is the group. German A is the Lie algebra. This is the dual vector space. And um, I take all symmetric powers. So you can think of this as polynomial functions. And they should be invariant under the Weyl group. This is the so-called Harish Chandra isomorphism, going from here to here. Um, so A is the Lie algebra, and it's isomorphic to R to the n minus 1. But we view it as a hyperplane in Rn. I mean, this is a f reflection of the fact that we are working with the projective group. So we are working with the trace 0 hyperplane. Trace zero hyperplane. So a typical element in A has n components and they add up to zero. Trace zero hyperplane in Rn. Uh, 
OK, and this isomorphism here sends a differential operator to, well, uh, a map lambda d that goes from a star to c. And for instance, the Laplacian, the Laplacian goes to um, the map that sends mu, which is mu 1 up to mu n. So this is now an arbitrary element in, in uh, well, in a star um, to n cubed minus n over 24 plus sum of the squares. Yeah. So to each, to each operator in script D, there is attached a polynomial. And um, this polynomial tells you that if you have an, an eigenform, an automorphic form with, with these spectral parameters, then the eigenvalue under the corresponding operator is this polynomial. OK. So. For me, always mu is the notation for an element, well, and potentially the complexification of the dual of the Lie algebra, um, say, modulo the Weyl group. These are the spectral parameters, or Langlands parameters. Uh, of an automorphic form. So each automorphic form comes with such an n-tuple of spectral parameters. And if you want to know what is the, uh, the eigenvalue of uh, this automorphic form with these spectral parameters, then you just plug the values into the respective polynomial under this isomorphism. OK, so for me, um, everything is normalized such that the Ramanujan conjecture, Ramanujan conjecture, says that the mu's are real. Uh, other people normalize differently. For instance, in Goldfeld's book. The unitary axis is uh, 1 over n plus i a star. And the, some other people, other authors, say that the unitary axis is i a star. This is a matter of taste. Uh, for me, the unitary axis is a star. OK, as you know, the Ramanujan conjecture is not known, not even for n equals 2. And the best general bounds are imaginary part of mu j is bounded by 1 over uh, 1 over 2 minus a half, well, plus a half minus 1 over n squared plus 1. And for n equals 2, better bounds are known. So are for n equals 3 and 4. But in general, these are the best bounds. And this is due to Luo, Rudnick, and Sarnak.
OK, so how many mass forms are there? Uh, how dense are they in some sense? And um, this is measured by the Harish Chandra C function. There is a general definition for the Harish Chandra C function for any Lie group in terms of root systems. Um, I'm not going to go into, into detail here. Um, let me just say that in our case of the group PGLN, the Harish Chandra C function uh, is given by a constant times the product 1 less or equal than j, less than k, less or equal than n. g of lambda j minus lambda k. where lambda is lambda 1 up to lambda n in A star, perhaps A star C. Um, well, let's define it only on A star. Well, yes, that's right, except that lambda for me is an integration variable. Later, I integrate over lambda, and I keep mu fixed for my favorite automorphic form. But yes, they play the same role. Uh, and g is a quotient of, uh, of gamma functions that you can simplify, and it just looks like x times tangent hyperbolic of pi x. So the tangent hyperbolic, of course, only plays a role if x is very small. Otherwise, this is essentially 1. Um, so g of x, for practical purposes, g of x is x. Um, well, in fact, it's absolute value of x. Um, because if x is negative, then also the tangent hyperbolic is negative. So this is bounded by product of 1 plus lambda j minus lambda k. OK, so unless there is some, co there is some conspiracy between the, the uh, components of lambda, um, if they are sort of generic, if you choose a, a generic lambda um, such that all these differences are roughly of the same size, uh, then this is the norm of lambda to the power n choose 2. Um, if you're at the walls of the Weyl chamber, when some of these are perhaps identical or very close to each other, then of course uh, the spectral measure is a bit smaller. So this drops at the walls of the Weyl chamber of the wild chambers. Yeah, so the, the density of mass forms is a bit less um, at the walls of the wild chamber. And there is a vile law. And this was proved by Müller and Lapid, 2009, that this spectral density really measures the density of mass forms. So the number of cusp forms with spectral parameter lambda plus O of 1. So you take a ball of size 1 about a given uh, parameter lambda is of size. C lambda. So what, what I wrote down here. Um, so I mean, the, cur the, the precise statement is a little different. So the, the ball has to be sufficiently large uh, in order to get a lower bound. And um, then if you, if you expand the region, then they actually get a, an asymptotic formula with, uh, with a power saving error term. So this counts uh, the number of mass forms. So for instance, in the case n equals 2, 
um, you get the usual while law, and this, this uh, then holds in general. OK. So I mentioned earlier, um, so I'm using these blackboards rather randomly. Um, so I mentioned earlier, for n equals, for n greater than 2, uh, there is no discrete series. We only have mass forms. However, we do have lifts from holomorphic forms of, uh, for, for n equals 2. We do have lifts from holomorphic forms on GL2. So you can take a holomorphic form on GL2 and, for instance, take the symmetric square, and then you get uh, a mass form on GL3. OK. Any questions? No. OK, then um, next thing I want to discuss are Whittaker functions. Whittaker functions. OK, Whittaker functions have two arguments. Well, they have an index and an argument. And the index lives on a c star modulo the Weyl group. And the argument lives on H, this H here. And the value is a complex number. OK, and they are defined as follows. We take an x in A, and I write down the first off-diagonal as x1 up to xn minus 1, and I don't care about the rest. <coughs> and then I can define a character. Theta of x is just e of some xj. This is a character on n. Character on n. And then a Whittaker function satisfies the following properties. W mu of xz is theta of x times w mu of z. So it transforms by multiplication from the left with respect to this character. For all z in h, x in n. And it satisfies a uh, um, differential equation. If I take a differ differential operator d in script d, then this is lambda d of mu. So lambda d is this map that I defined up there times w mu of z for all d in d. OK, so this is what I want to call a Whittaker function. It's by no means clear that such objects exist and so on. But they do exist, and you can actually explicitly construct them as follows. 
So in particular, these are all eigenfunctions of, uh, of this algebra script D. Construction is as follows. You integrate over n uh, a function i that I'm going to define in a, in a moment, i mu. You take the long vial element, w long, times u times z, theta bar of u, du. u is the Haar measure on n. And i mu of z depends, in fact, only on x. Uh, sorry, it depends only on y. It's independent of x. It's a product. It's basically a power function. j from 1 to n minus 1, yj to some power, lj of mu, uh, where these are linear forms in the mu that I'm not going to write down. So lj is a suitable linear polynomial. Basically, the idea is, so you choose Lj in such a way that this power function, I mu, satisfies exactly this differential equation. And then the Whittaker function inherits the differential equation from the differential equation of I. You don't have to take the long vial element. You can also take other vial elements here. And then you get degenerate Whittaker functions um, that come up in the constant terms uh, of the Fourier expansion of Eisenstein series. So um, yeah, if you take other vial elements than the long ele vial element, you get degenerate uh, Whittaker functions. Degenerate Whittaker functions. for other vile elements. For other vile elements, will the integral, the integral be convergent? Sorry, what's that? For other vile elements, other than the long element, uh, the integral will be convergent? The, the what? The integral will be convergent? Ah, um. I mean, for GI2, uh, I mean, there are well, yes. I mean, probably, you, probably you can't take the trivial vial element, um, and for GL2 there is no other vial element. Uh, but uh, if you take, uh, I think, if you take a non-trivial vial element, uh, then it converges. Okay. So I mean, okay. So you can write this down. In principle, it's completely explicit. It's an integral of the unipotent group. Um, but uh, these Whittaker functions, we have to admit, they are very poorly understood. OK, as an example, the case n equals 2, well, then we can write down explicitly the Whittaker function. So the Whittaker function has an argument here, which is a pair of two numbers that add up to 0. So it's mu minus mu. And then traditionally, it's just mu. There is no extra information. But nevertheless, z is up to scalar multiplication square root of y, e of x, k i mu of 2 pi y. And then it's a matter of taste whether you further normalize this or not. I like to normalize it by multiplying by cosine hyperbolic pi mu over 2. Um, but again, that's a matter of taste if you want to do this or not. The Bessel k function decays exponentially in mu so you can compensate for this um, by multiplying with the cosine hyperbolic, or you can you don't have to do this. And OK, so Bessel functions are fairly well understood. Um, so this is a Whittaker function that we can handle. But in general, for n greater than 2, 
it's very poorly understood. So if you take the construction you gave for n equals two, do you get this cosine hyperbolic? Just literally take this integral. Um, I forget. Um, uh, this is, so the, the cosine hyperbolic, um, if you include it or not, is a matter of whether you take the so-called completed Whittaker function or not. Um, I have to look it up. I, I, I forget whether this integral produces the completed Whittaker function or not. OK, um, but we do have some partial knowledge uh, on general Whittaker functions. And what we know is the following. So it can be, so you can recursively um, get a degree n Whittaker function by integrating a degree n minus 1 Whittaker function. Then if you repeat this, you can uh, get down to degree 2 Whittaker functions, which are Bessel functions. So general Whittaker functions are integrals over Bessel functions. So it can be expressed as iterated integrals over Bessel functions, over k Bessel functions. But of course, if n gets big, then you get a whole bunch of integrals, and things become very complicated. But in principle, there is such a formula, and that's u to state, Eric state. I would believe, in the spirit of, um, of Emmanuel's talk, that this is a reflection of the fact that um, the GLN Klostermann sum attached to, to the long vial element, at least in certain cases, can be written as a product of GL2 Klostermann sums if the moduli are, are pairwise co-prime. And I would assume that this is uh, some weak form of re reflection of this fact that in certain cases uh, you can reduce the GLN case to products of, of GL2. For n equals 3, um, a bit more is known. So for n equals 3, we have a fairly explicit. The, the iteration in the multiplicative convolution? Um, I'm not sure. I have to look it up. Um, I, it is. I think it's more complicated. You get arguments u. Well, perhaps it's, you get u, u and 1 over u. And, well, it's, it's, I, I don't know exactly. It, I think it's not just a multiplicative convolution. It's a bit more complicated than that. But you can look it up in, in State's paper. Um, we know the double Mellin transform of, so if we keep x fixed, then in the variable z, so in the variable y, I have two entries y1 and y2. So the double Mellin transform uh, in y, y1 to the power s1, y2 to the power s2, dy1, dy2 over y1, y2 is known. And it's, in fact, what you, well, perhaps, I don't know if you would expect this, but certainly it's a ratio of gamma factors. So that's fairly simple. And then we have a very important formula. That's a very strong tool. Um, and it's called state's formula. Um, this is the Archimedean rankin selberg theory. It's the product of two Whittaker functions. If you take W alpha, of y and w beta of y bar, determinant of y to the power s, and then the correct measure on the group A. So in the classical case, this is a product of two Bessel functions. But now you take a, a product of two general Whittaker functions. And this is the sort of Rankine-Selberg um, ratio of gamma factors. Uh, so it is what you would expect. Uh, 
so gamma, uh, okay, gamma r is, is the usual thing. I'll define it in a second. It's s plus i alpha. Uh, I hope I get the signs right. Um, alpha j minus beta bar k. I hope that's correct. Where j and k run from one to n. So basically, you take the the Langlands parameters and and combine them uh, each with each. Divided by whatever you expect from Rankine-Selberg theory, gamma r of ns, so that's kind of zeta of 2 in the, in the classical case. And uh, then product, so here you get a, a kind of uh, symmetric square L function at 1, gamma r 1 plus i alpha j minus alpha k, gamma r 1 minus i beta bar j minus beta bar k. So I don't know if this is readable or not. Hopefully it's not readable because it's perhaps slightly wrong. But, um, and perhaps there is a constant involved. Um, so if you want to get the constants right, that's also a complete nightmare because everybody normalizes slightly differently. And you can be sure you're, in the end, you'll be off by a power 2 pi. OK, so what is gamma r? Gamma r is the usual thing. Gamma r of s is pi to the minus s over 2 um, times gamma of s over 2. OK, um, yeah, let me just, okay, uh, let me just write down one more formula to wrap this up, and then I'm done for today. In GL2, there is the so-called kontorovich lebedev transform. If you integrate the Bessel k function um, uh, against the test function and then integrate it back, but this time over the index, uh, then you get the original function back. And this holds in general. And this was recently proved by Goldfeld and Kontorovich. So if you start with a test function f and you integrate it against a Whittaker function, And you call this f hat of mu. Then you can recover f from f hat. So if you integrate f hat of mu against the Whittaker function, and now you integrate with respect to mu, d mu over the spectral measure. OK, I said that lambda would be my integration variable. Now it's mu, whatever. Um, over the over a star, then you get f back. So I, this is the the Whittaker Montreal theorem, right? I'm just, yes, yes, yes. I'm just it, it isn't that was proved maybe by Waller. Okay, that's true. Uh, that's that's true. But uh, yes, um, okay. Yeah, Goldfeld and Kontorovich give a very explicit formulation of this. But certainly, you find an abstract version of this in, in Wallach's book and in Wallach's work. It's, it's really Wallach, yeah. Yes, OK. OK, fair enough. OK. OK. Um, <laughs> didn't you say yesterday, I'm going to conclude the session? No. OK, anyway, so that's it. Are there any questions? OK, well, that's it for today.
there's a speaker already asked for questions, but if you just want to take questions only from the organizers, then you can ask the questions now. And so, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so regarding the leaps, uh, this might be a stupid question. How many percent? How, how What is the percentage uh, you can get uh, in the leap from which you can get from a lower uh, a lower order? In general, you mean? Uh, in a special case, for instance. Well, I mean, you can. If you look at Weil's law, um, so for GL three, in if you if you take uh, so here here you're sitting in in A star. Um, and um, in a ball of radius one of size t, you have roughly t to the three guys of mass forms. And on the diagonal, um, so the um, the 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 um, Jackie, uh, nah, Gelba Jackie lifts uh, by Weil's law for GL two, they are of size t. Right. So you have t lifts sitting exactly on the diagonal, and um, but in the whole square of size one. So this is t, t plus one, t, t plus one. Um, so in this ball of size one, you have altogether t to the three mass forms. So the lifts are in some sense negligible. Okay, thank you again.